Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School here at Harvard University. I'm so glad to see all of these seats filled. Next time, bring more of your friends. The ILP is a living memorial to President Kennedy. Our mission is to inspire, encourage, and support the political and public service aspirations of young people, especially undergraduates. Tonight, our distinguished panel takes up the vital question of how government policies affect the internet entrepreneur. The internet, with its reach, its speed, its power, connects us to people, ideas, information, commerce, art, the past, the present, the future, and so much more. The internet is a part of a new frontier that President Kennedy talked about so eloquently. The new frontier, he said, was a place where things were changing, requiring a new generation of leadership, new men and women who would tackle new problems and create new opportunities. Our forum panelists are representative of the kind of thinkers and practitioners that <coughs> President Kennedy said we would need to grapple with new opportunities and challenges. In the internet age, we face a complex set of issues, including whether or not more, less, or no regulation in this space is merited, as well as what supports are needed to incentivize innovation and entrepreneurship in a new era, in a new era that is unfolding even as we speak. Now, tonight's forum is a prelude to a full day of discussions tomorrow on these critical topics, and I was told to say, I'm sorry, Friday sessions are full to capacity, but will be live streamed on our website, iop.harvard.edu, and aired on C-SPAN in the coming weeks. Archon Fung, the academic dean of the Kennedy School, who has served as the Ford Foundation uh, Professor of Democracy and Citizenship here at the Kennedy School, will moderate tonight's discussion. Thank you, Dean. And finally, the IOP has two extraordinary partners in the development of this forum and the framing of our two-day conversations on this topic. The Berkman Center for Internet and Society at the Kennedy School, which is co-led by professors Deborah Crawford and Jonathan Zitran, who we'll be hearing from tomorrow. And the Internet Association, led by its president and CEO, Michael Becker. Michael's organization represents America's leading internet companies and advances public policy solutions meant to strengthen and protect internet freedom and foster innovation and economic growth. It's been wonderful to partner with you, Michael, and I'd like to invite you up to say a few words. Thank you, Maggie for the kind introduction, it's great to be here today. There's uh, an incredibly strong connection between internet companies and Harvard. Many of the most successful and well-known companies on the internet are founded by Harvard graduates. And we have Stephen Coffer here today, who's a Harvard graduate and uh, is the founder and CEO of TripAdvisor and many others. And uh, many of the, the leaders and executives from our internet companies all graduated from Harvard. And we have a number of them that are joining us uh, for the forum today and tomorrow, and thank you for participating. But also, there's some internet companies that were founded by people who merely spent time in the dorm room here at Harvard, or just across the street, and that's, that's good too. Um, the Internet Association, we lie at the intersection of the internet economy, policy, and politics, and we're proud to partner again with the Berkman Center and Harvard's Institute of Politics today. At the Internet Association, we have the high privilege of representing more than two dozen of the most well-known, innovative, exciting internet companies in the world. And this conference comes at a very important time for our companies uh, and the internet as a whole. The internet is really one of the greatest engines for economic growth, freedom, and prosperity the world has ever known. But it is a disruptive technology. It's disruptive in a positive way, but even positive disruption runs into policy and political roadblocks. The internet challenges entrenched special interests and the established order. But this disruption does lead to economic growth and social progress. It can also cause friction with outdated or inflexible regulations. A fundamental principle is at stake here. 
our nation's laws and the governing philosophy behind them must foster innovation rather than stifle it. The Internet's decentralized and open model has been the catalyst for the powerful growth that we've seen. And these, press, these principles must be embodied in our nation's laws and in the, the uh, approach and philosophy that our elected officials take to policymaking. And legal and, and, uh, and regulatory regimes must remain up to date to maintain a free and open internet, remove barriers to entry, and provide flexibility for future invention. The internet is a global medium, and there are many global and worldwide issues at stake. Policymakers must promote trade policies that facilitate the free flow of information across borders, consistent with the global nature of the internet. And one cannot address internet policy without looking at the questions of broadband, both in terms of access and adoption. The digital divide between internet haves and have-nots is persistent barrier that should be addressed. And we also need to have strong, enforceable net neutrality rules to ensure that internet users can access the entire internet of their choosing. The United States Congress must deal with the issue of patent trolls, and I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about them uh, this evening. They're nothing more than court-sponsored extortion. They are a hidden tax on our economy. I'm not going to mince words. Uh, and they impede innovation and job creation here in America. Um, our, and additionally, our local and state governments need to recognize the incredible value that new generation of internet companies bring to our local communities. When entrenched incumbent interests work with regulators and elected officials to put up artificial barriers blocking competition, we all lose. We're seeing a tale of two cities across the country and around the world. We have communities that welcome the likes of Airbnb and Uber and Lyft, and we have others that block these companies, trying to stop competition of new entrants. Where these new entrants are allowed to enter the market, you see growth and prosperity, and in other areas, it's a little sad. Actually, it's great being in Boston and being able to take an Uber from the airport. Surprisingly, that's not true in every single city in this country. And so it's essential that we discuss this topic at, at forums like this, we're able to merge uh, the best minds in academia and industry to talk about po uh, important policy issues and uh, help sway the debate. And with that, um, we'll hand it over to the panel. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for uh, spending the afternoon with us to talk about uh, the internet and the relationship between government and entrepreneurs and how uh, either and both of them can work together to advance the public good. We uh, couldn't have two more capable people talk about this uh, topic here tonight, uh, one of whom from primarily from government. I don't think Susan is, is uh, led a startup, but she's done so many things, she may well have done that and has escaped my attention. But our first guest tonight is uh, Susan Crawford, who moves very smoothly and continuously across the private sector, government, and academia. She's currently the John A. Riley Visiting Professor of Intellectual Property at the Harvard Law School, where she teaches internet, communication, and internet law and communications law, doing a course uh, this semester on internet surveillance and electronic surveillance. And she is a co-director of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, along with Jonathan Zittrain. Susan has published numerous articles on communications, technology, and innovation, including two books. The first is Captive Audience, The Telecom Industry and Monopoly Power, and we'll be talking a little bit about uh, the incumbent actors tonight, I imagine. And the second book, which just came out this week, is The Responsive City, Engaging Communities Through Data and Smart Governance, together with uh, my colleague Steve Goldsmith. In 2008, she co-led President Obama's FCC transition team and served as, in the White House as special assistant to the President for Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy. She was also a member of Michael Bloomberg's Advisory Council on Technology and Innovation in 2009. Uh, her prolific work has, has earned her many, many um, titles and recognition, including by Prospect Magazine as one of the top 10 brains of the digital future in 2011 and one of Time Magazine's 40 Most Influential Minds in Tech in 2013. Our second guest is Stephen Kaufer, who co-founded TripAdvisor in 2000, which seems like an eon ago in internet time, right. with a mission to help travelers around the world plan and have the perfect trip. How many people have used TripAdvisor? I think it's just about everyone. Thank you all. <laughs> Under his leadership, TripAdvisor has grown to the largest travel site in the world and now includes 24 travel brands. 
Prior to TripAdvisor, Steve was president of the software company CDS Incorporated and was co-founder and vice president uh, of engineering at Centerline Software. He holds several software patents. We'll also be talking about that subject in just a moment. Steve is on the board of directors at Glassdoor, Car Gurus, and the Caring for the Carcinoid Foundation. And he's been uh, lauded for his business stewardship and received Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2005. Another site I love is Glassdoor. How many people have visited Glassdoor? You know what it, it's, a, it's a site that reviews companies from the perspective of employees. You should check it out. It tries to make companies in the labor market more transparent. Uh, in preparing for this panel, I looked up my employer, Harvard University, on Glassdoor. <laughs> There's a lot of employers, uh, employees at Harvard University, and you'll be pleased to know that it does very, very well. Average rating of Harvard University as an employer is four out of five stars, and my, my boss, President Drew Faust, has a very high approval rating of nine, 93%. Better than me, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Um, so we'll kind of do this uh, discussion in a little bit of a, a dialogue format. Uh, what unites us all here at uh, the Kennedy School and the Harvard University more broadly is a deep, deep desire to find better ways to advance the public good. And tonight's conversation is about how internet entrepreneurs and the government working separately and together can advance that public good. Now, internet entrepreneurs have brought amazing advances that exploit digital technologies and fundamentally transform the ways that we learn, the ways that we consume, the ways that we produce and make things, and even the ways that we relate to one another. TripAdvisor is an example of, of one of those transformations, fundamentally disrupted the travel industry and in the ways that all, evidently all of us in this room figure out where to go and maybe more importantly where not to go. Um, so the first question, and um, I'll direct this to Steve first and then, and then Susan in a moment. Steve, what is one important example of how, what government might do now or could have done to make your life easier as an internet entrepreneur providing this information to lots of people? Uh, sure. So when, you know, when we started, when I started at a couple of earlier companies, or at TripAdvisor, the notion of the internet being a way that we could reach consumers directly, instantly, with a great product, if we could come up with a great product, was a fabulous enabler. So I looked at government, or I still look at government, and say, how can the government best not get in the way, or through policies or laws, cause others to set up roadblocks for me? And this leads me straight to the software patent piece, because Yes, I have some software patents to my name, not because I ever wanted to actually enforce them as a competitive advantage, but because I was scared that somebody else was going to come after me, which, <laughs> as a bigger company, lots of companies have for absolutely no reason whatsoever. So it's just, as, uh, as was said before, a big tax on all entrepreneurs and reasonably big companies like TripAdvisor and the big Goliaths in the industry. So if you make me pick one, I'd, I'd still come back to the patent issue. Mm, very good. Susan. Well, the school year is just beginning, so we're not tired, we're not jaded, we're not cynical. <laughs> and uh, the idea of the internet is so rich, it's so interesting. It is the ultimate level playing field. It's interconnecting disparate networks. That was the point. And that idea could not have swept the world without government building block research assistance. So a very important role that government plays for entrepreneurs is to invest in those building blocks, which include basic R&D research, education, so there's a thriving middle class that can take advantage of your services, uh, making sure that we are looking at, uh, uh, it's just a street grid, education, R&D, basic energy resources for uh, uh, the people who are not just buying, but also flourishing online. This is not just about economic growth. It's about the development of culture, social thriving. That's one step, investing in building blocks. The second, beyond just the basic infrastructure, which we desperately need in America. By the way, make a phone call today, it still drops. Why? We don't have enough fiber in the United States. It needs to be everywhere, it needs to be ubiquitous, it needs to be cheap. We'll get there someday, but we're not there yet. 
Second step is create the legal infrastructure that your company needs. Software patents are destructive, but there's lots of good stuff, too. Enforcement of contracts, antitrust policy that keeps the big guys from stepping on you, um, uh, making sure there's a functioning banking system. Government does big things, and right now the public sector is also attempting to innovate. We're seeing lots of cities develop much more technological capacity. That's what this book, The Response of Cities, is about happening at the federal level, too. And I see lots of intersections between civic-minded entrepreneurs, especially your generation, students who want to go into government and serve and make it more like the private companies they love in the sense of responsiveness and agility and use of technology. So this is a very exciting time to be talking about the role of government and the intersection between the building blocks, the legal structure, and the solving the grand challenges of our era, which include public innovation these days. Very good. So what TripAdvisor does is create transparency. And transparency is good, um, usually, I think. It's my belief that transparency is usually good. And uh, what it does is it creates transparency in, in a way that's it's kind of new, at least for the next co uh, past couple of decades, which is to ask lots of people what they think about something. And we're familiar with this experience now in, with Amazon book ratings and, and Yelp restaurant reviews, as well as TripAdvisor. And we were talking a little bit before, that's a fundamentally different way of knowing what the world is like than an expert kind of telling you whether or not you should buy something and whether something is good or bad, right? Uh, and so when, before all of this crowdsourcing, I was, a, I still am a subscriber to Consumer Reports and rely heavily on Consumer Reports. Uh, there's lots of cases where I rely on uh, government and scientists rating something for me. I think I still read the New York Times more than a bunch of my other news feeds which are less hierarchical and curated. So if you guys could talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages. When is it better to know something because an expert trained at the Kennedy School or other parts of Harvard University tell you this is the case versus all of your friends and social networks telling you that it's a good thing? Susan. Sure, happy to talk about it. I mean, these, there is no one answer. This is not binary. And the wonderful thing about digital technology is we can now see lots of input coming in from different directions. So the, your expert you know, advice at some level on TripAdvisor, plus uh, maybe somebody who's uh, you know, newer to the application, we can now see, we can only make progress when you see something. And being able to visualize all of these inputs and understand how they map together against your own experience is something that's new and something that governments, again, are just starting to do. Grade.dc.gov lets you rate the DMV from your smartphone as you walk towards the desk and has actually led to changes in the way the district runs its local offices. Governments both provide services and uh, need to be responsive in a way that they haven't been traditionally. So actually, they're great opportunities in the crowdsourced visualization of data for government services. And, and I, uh, I extend that and to the question, talk about uh, ratings that are opinionated, they're judgmental, they're an act of a human that might have an opinion on one day and a different opinion the next. Two employees at a company can report different experiences on Glassdoor. Two travelers to the exact same hotel can have different levels of service, can expect different things. Both opinions are equally valid. And as a consumer, I'd like to see the wide variety of opinions. But, and, and that's why I think the world has spoken that the TripAdvisor model of crowdsourcing all these opinions just delivers better results than what was the one person professional guidebook visiting once a year to a select set of places with one little data point, an educated data point, but just one. And the wisdom of the crowds is, uh, I'd like to think, clearly one in this particular case. But when I went to go buy a new car, I went to the National Highway Safety Transportation, uh, the government agency that's testing 
the crash safety of the various different cars I was looking at buying. And uh, no offense, folks, I don't want any of your opinions about whether the car <laughs> is safe or not. I actually want the government to actually go and crash a few of them, see what breaks, see how safe I'm going to be in my passengers when I look at that. And that's a perfect example where the government can and does step in, provides very valuable information. I presume they make it available for free. If they don't, they certainly should, so that any consumer can use it from, from any perspective. We see the governments adopting this notion that transparency is a great thing in a host of different countries. You talk about it at the city level, uh, numerous examples at various cities where, where they're providing a service. They really want to hear what the consumer has to say about, be it potholes or electrical service or whatever the issues are. Uh, in the UK, the, uh, the National uh, Health Service demands all of the hospitals to collect patient feedback after they leave. And the doctors were absolutely crazy about this. How could a patient rate a service? Uh, and well, isn't that all going to be about outcomes? And of course, if the patient uh, isn't going to fare well, they're going to rate it poorly. And that's completely unfair to the doctor. So they said, answer, no, the patients are actually pretty smart about what they're rating. And they find, they have found that the service levels that the patients are reporting correspond to health outcomes and the floors and the hospitals that get the better service ratings. So the nurses, the doctors pay more attention because the spotlight is shown on them. And the spotlight is shown on them, they pay closer attention. And guess what? The patient outcomes are better. What happened? Just a bit of transparency. What happened in the travel industry? We've shown a spotlight on a bunch of hotels or restaurants or attractions that were doing a terrible job. And they got to the very bottom of our you know, ranked list. And the manager said, ooh, we're losing business. Better up my game. The spotlight's on me. And it's not only whether the person smiled when they left, it's what they said in this open forum. Bingo, transparency helps. And of course, the better places get more business. Consumers, all of you aware, so you shop, you buy something that uh, is better because of the feedback that the previous person left. That's great. And so all of this data allows, uh, about all sorts of things, allows enormous improvements in services and many other things. Um, but some of the data are data about us and our private behaviors, or they're, maybe they're not private. Maybe that, that's the issue. And so I want to turn a little bit to the issue of privacy. So I, I bought a, a three Nest thermostats a few months ago, you know, these thermostats that, are, that uh, know where you are and if you're in the room, it heats, I thought I'd do my little bit for the whales, right? <laughs> um, and I loved it and then a, about a month later, Google acquired the company. And I, I, then I got a little bit nervous because I think Google's an information tech company. That's, that's mm -hmm. what they do. They, they gather data and they analyze it and then they eventually try to make some money off of it. And so the, uh, and I'm not sure if I want Google to know whether I'm in my living room or at home or not, right? And so the question is, two, for the entrepreneur, the question is, what is the approach to protecting your user's privacy? Is it enough for, I, I'm sure everybody's clicked on a terms of service agreement in the last week. I'm equally sure that none of you have read it, except for maybe Susan, because it's, it's her <laughs> field, right? Um, so one thing might be, OK, I sign a contract. Another is, well, maybe if I abuse my users, the markets will kill me. Another is I have a social responsibility to do certain things to protect privacy and these beliefs. Another is that government has regulations. As long as I stay within the rules of the road, I'm good. How do you think about privacy? I mean, you're, uh, well, Stephen, first, I mean, you have actual users with lots of data. It's a live issue for you. And then Susan, from the regulatory perspective. Sure. Yeah, so in, uh, uh, given the fact that there isn't a lot of regulation out there, there aren't even a lot of kind of best practices that the industry has agreed upon. We approach it from a, uh, well, look, it's my data too. Uh, it's me browsing and, hey, I'm looking at different hotels and restaurants in different cities. How comfortable am I sharing that data widely? And the common, or at least in our thinking, the common accepted answer is, in aggregate, 
no individual has a right to object when I say 38% of my population of my visitors are interested in in X. We've taken a step further with our Facebook integration. To say, hey, if you connect with Facebook, we're going to uh, share what your friends have posted on the site by their name, if your friends have given permission. That's the added step that we put on. We have the technical capability to do it anyways, but hey, if I'm writing a review, do I want even my friends to be able to see it without my permission? No, I like that anonymous. So then you move along to the, well, how do you feel if I uh, retarget, you're, you're on my site, you're visiting Vegas, maybe you shouldn't be visiting Vegas, and you're on another site, and I show you an ad about great hotel deals in, in Vegas. You okay with that? Well, it's guess what? a little creepy. It's happening everywhere, it just is. Every travel site, every other site is retargeting based upon your behavior. We're not naming you, that would be extra creepy, but now it's just kind of social, social norms or social responsibility on our part that says, hey, there is that line because if we greeted you by name in that retargeted ad, you'd probably be upset and you'd be upset with me, rightfully so. So it's very much self-policed. Mm. Uh, I, I, my nightmare scenario is every government or every local you know, city level government comes up with their own unique rules and, <laughs> and I have to go figure out 500 different rules to operate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Susan, self-policing enough? Or? Well, I think this is another great growth opportunity for students, frankly, because on the one hand, everything is being collected, and especially on the technocrat side of the world, we're delighted with the possibilities, the commercial and, frankly, the government possibilities in knowing everything. Really, there's great joy, almost uninhibited joy. And on the other oh, side... I'll convince you, you do want to see a hotel ad rather than a right, Pampers exactly. ad when yeah, you're shopping No, there are great hotel. benefits to it, huge benefits. Exactly. But we're at such a primitive stage in this conversation. And on the other side, there are people who are just freaked out at the least mention of privacy in their lives or that their data, is, they're going to be trapped. A hand will reach through the computer screen and grab them. And there, there seem to be almost, there are very few people who actually are bridging this gap we have very few rules in place, and yet everything is being collected. Nobody's talking about this very effectively, and there's a great opportunity for policymakers who understand something about technology to get in there and actually work on best practices with you know, industry groups, um, make transparent, show your work somehow as both a government or a private company. What are you doing with data? How can you generate trust? And then a third step is forensic. We do know that everything's going to be collected. The real frontier is who's getting access to what and how is that information then being used? Looking backwards and then having those forensic capabilities when triggered, when there's uh, access that's inappropriate, lead to consequences. Somebody gets fired, you know, if they're snooping on their ex-girlfriend using this data in some way. Um, we're not yet anywhere near that conversation. And there's a huge opportunity for policymakers who can bridge the gap between tech and government. And so the privacy is maybe an instance of a, of a tension that I want to explore a little bit, which is entrepreneurship on one hand and regulation on the other, right? And so on one picture, which I think is the picture of the internet um, revolution to date, we think, less regulation is better, and indeed, many of my friends in Silicon Valley think that mostly what they're doing is working around totally broken government in one way or another, and they, they can't even imagine a government that would work any better than, so the best of all possible worlds is actually the workaround, right? Um, and so that's, let's say, the first 20 years of the digital <laughs> revolution, but now we're coming in to a stage in which maybe parts of the public are getting a little bit worried about some of the consequences of the wild, wild west entrepreneurial activities and some of the negative unintended consequences, whether it's Uber and Lyft or uh, privacy issues or monopoly control issues. And so maybe there's going to be some kind of regulation coming in. We'd all like it if that regulation were smart and intelligent rather than all thumbs and no fingers, right? And so I want to ask a little bit about how we get there and then whether there are any 
signposts in your research or your experience? Are there some governments who you feel like, yeah, I understand the need that I need to be regulated. Maybe you wouldn't even concede that point, but if you do, and, and I feel like these governments are better regulators, regulate in a way that is compatible with entrepreneurial innovation and growth rather than stifling of it, right? And then what do those regulations look like in the zone of privacy or we talked about speech and um, defamation issues, et cetera, and then Susan for obviously the monopoly issues. Well, I mean, I actually think the U.S. is better than, I don't know if I could say most, but many other big foreign governments in terms of not applying a ton of regulation or having broader free speech protections. As we talk about how the internet and transparency can really help improve the city government, the health service, the hotel, travel industry, the employers, whatever, uh, there, there's a lot of laws on the books in other countries that inhibit the, uh, the notion of being able to post an anonymous review. Hey, uh, you can see both sides of it. Hey, the person that uh, is receive, on the receiving end of the criticism really doesn't like that it's anonymous and they can't even verify it's a legit person, et cetera, versus the overall benefit of having the volume of opinions that anonymous reviews can bring. Different governments have taken different approaches. The US is, is pretty darn good, not perfect, but pretty darn good in that regard. How you take it beyond not just the, not just the, the free speech aspects, but regulating all of the pieces, you know, net neutrality is right there, and it's kind of important that the right answer be achieved in order to let this complete, uh, to let the platform do its magic. And I think over the past 10 years, the platform in this country has done amazing magic, this country and so many others, such that even the big companies uh, have lots of small companies that have come up, grown up, a Snapchat that didn't exist a few yeah. years ago, bingo, big, and they got there because there weren't any speed bumps along the way, at least so far. Now look, the whole point, it's funny that regulation feels like an imprecation. Why, why are we swearing when we say the word <laughs> regulation? <laughs> but actually, the idea behind regulation is to unleash the human spirit. That's the point. When a kudzu of rules gets created that gets in the way, that's a problem. But basically, infrastructure is different from applications. We need government rules that uh, uh, harness the overwhelming need of a private monopolist, otherwise control communication networks. We don't have that right now in this country, and so we've seen tremendous aggregation of private power over internet access to the point where Comcast is your only choice in Cambridge. How could that be? How could that be? And it's expensive. And uh, they're not going to be neutral. They've got prioritized lanes inside their network. It, it seems improbable, um, but there's a, there's a very strong role for government in making sure that we have a working electrical grid, a working telecommunications network, and a banking system, and, and antitrust law, and all these basic things. You can call them regulations, but they unleash entrepreneurial activity. And what we want to avoid are rules that, like sometimes the procurement rules inside government, and the civil service rules that really just are a growth of kudzu-like proportions that keep people from being able to do their business effectively. So um, this question is for Susan. So uh, I imagine that uh, many people in the audience are um, imagine themselves wanting to advance the public good, fully aware of the internet revolution, and, and so want to combine those things in some way. I don't want to start a startup. That's not really my thing. I want to go into government. Um, what should I be doing over the next two or three years to be the best that I can to leverage the internet, these amazing technologies that have evolved to make government better to advance the public good? Well, even having that mindset, our company, <laughs> you've come very far. That I think we're coming to the point where a lot of people are going to retire in local, state, and federal government. And a whole new generation is going to come in. And I see in my students enormous interest, in, interest really civic interest, in serving, and there's a great appetite for that across the country. So just find your, um, uh, your co-conspirators inside government and outside. There's a big community of people who are trying to find their ways in. With your attitude of being interested in serving, the doors are actually wide open. Learn as much as you can. 
I think law is a good thing to know about, but also technology, literacy in these tools, uh, having basic data literacy is becoming part of education, even though in the United States, only 14 states allow you to take a computer science course for credit in high school. I mean, you know, allow you to not have to claim it as an elective, right? That's a problem, and so we need to revolutionize our secondary school curriculum and community college curriculum, get everybody in there uh, learning more about data and uh, becoming comfortable with it as a new form of literacy. Um, spend some time at MIT if you're not getting the courses here that you need. Harvard has a wonderful CS department. CS50. Uh, CS50, but uh, <laughs> this base, it should be embarrassing to think of yourself as a, a future uh, worker in government who is not literate in technology, and, and yet there are far too many people who, who aren't embarrassed. It's our <laughs> opportunity to shame them at this point. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> and Steve, the flip side of the question, I'm, I'm confident that at least a few people in the audience, maybe a lot more than that, want to be internet entrepreneurs and hopefully with an eye toward advancing the public good. What would be your advice to them? How should they spend the next two or three years in tooling up to be equipped to do what you're doing? Oh, I, I mean, I, I think the, one of the great leveling aspects of the internet in general is how much information is out there completely for free, whether it's actually taking your own programming class, a design class, uh, uh, all of the different ways that you can learn almost anything you're interested in uh, at a very professional level between the university classes online, between you know, the YouTube demos of just about anything you can think of. Oh my gosh, what my 15-year-old kid can do now compared to what I could do when I was his age in the field of building his own apps. Uh, okay, he's off there. Does he know all the rest of the marketing stuff? No, but as soon as he has an interest in that, he'll go online and he'll figure it out. He'll talk to a few other people. It's got to be the easiest time in the world to be an entrepreneur in the internet category because the cost of capital is so low to, to be a force and the information is so available. So it's just the general startup advice. Have an idea, be persistent, be ready to change, pivot as many times as you need to, and just don't give up. Good, thank you. So I think we'll move into questions now. Uh, we have uh, a few minutes for questions, and for those of you who are new to the forum, there are three rules, three ground rules. First is all questioners must identify themselves. The second rule is one per customer. Questions must be brief and one per person, no speeches. And the third rule is that questions end with a question mark. So having laid out those ground rules, think about them for a minute, and then uh, if you, people can queue up to the microphones on either side of the stage, and then there's two up there as well. Um, and then uh, please indicate whether the question is for Steve or Susan or both. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is Tiffany Lazo. I'm a junior at the college. Um, my question was more for Mr. Kaufer. Um, I was just interested because I've heard of many instances in which there have been lawsuits over reviews posted on TripAdvisor, or even lawsuits towards TripAdvisor. And I was just wondering, how exactly do you manage those lawsuits, and how do they impact your relationship with federal government or local governments that you try to collaborate with? Uh, so we don't, uh, in our business model, we don't need a lot of collaboration with the local governments. So in general, we try to do what we think is right. And so we get lawsuits from, or mostly threaten lawsuits, occasionally a real lawsuit, uh, from a hotel or a restaurant owner who feels like a review has been posted that's completely unfair. Before it gets to the lawsuit, they ask us to take the review down. We check to see if it, we do a double check to see if it accidentally got past any of our fraud filters. Presuming it didn't, we tell the person the review stayed up and we tell the owner, please write a response to the review. Share your side of the story. So it's not a you know, mudslinging in one direction without a response. Uh, many, uh, the, the best owners do that. They realize it's an open forum. And then the ones that are so desperate will in fact sue us. At which point they can't get the information from us. 
Uh, the U.S. has very strong laws that allow those reviews to be posted as opinionated content, and we're protected because we're not an official publisher of, uh, of the event, we're not uh, of the comment, we're not in editorial control. It gets a little messier when we go overseas, where there are uh, more active takedown laws, where we have to take, it, take a review down while it's being investigated by us. We have to be very careful not to be the editor-in-chief that determines whether the review is accurate or not. We can't get in the middle of those. There are millions of reviews coming in weekly, right? So it's just a lot of quantity that really help the whole story turn out better for everyone because of that quantity. Uh, so a long-winded answer, sorry to your question. Thank you. Oh, sorry. So, um, Nicholas from France. I'm a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. And my question is to the panel, and it's about technological unemployment. As we're moving towards big data, and we're getting ruled by algorithms and robots, uh, there is an increasing fear that we're racing against the machine, and that the low-skilled people are going to face a, an additional big wave of unemployment. And I'd like to get your thoughts about this and how to address that problem, which is going to be increasingly serious in the coming decade. The world is changing, and we're much more of a service economy at this point. Many new jobs are also being created. So my great-grandfather was one of the last manufacturers of wooden railroad ties, and he went out of business when the concrete railroad ties came in. He had to repurpose himself. The same thing is happening with uh, people who had been in manufacturing jobs or travel in agriculture. Agents. And travel agents, they're gone too. But there are many more jobs sort of an eBay for services that people, people can find ways to divide up their time and provide uh, paid for services online from a remote location that were impossible even 10 years ago. So the world continues to change. We now have an electronic layer to our lives. We should not be afraid. We should find ways to harness it. I would add, you, you do have firms like TripAdvisor that have displaced a number of travel agents because it's just a better product service. Not all of them, because there are some that still do a terrific job. On the other hand, we in turn employ quite a few people delivering our product and service, and countless more across the globe using services like a Mechanical Turk or a Samosource that reach out to many different parts of the world for some of those tasks that we don't find a computer able to do, period, and I'm not sure it's gonna be a much better job having a computer do it in a few more years. So that's a, that's a constant new source. It doesn't happen to be here as much, but even here you have the task rabbits and the Ubers creating new jobs through that opportunity. Up there. Hi, my name is Sylvia and I'm a senior at the college. I just wanted to get the panel's opinion on, you said regulations can be a good thing, but when you look at the EU, for example, new laws have come out where you can petition to have certain material removed from Google, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and that can be extremely abusive to the idea of the internet being a platform of multiple ideas, multiple forms of information, so how can the government, a government really toe the line between having effective regulation and having a system that can be easily abused or exploited um, from information that can be detrimental to someone or a business. Ooh, that, we'll have to share that one. <laughs> I mean, a super tough one, but a great plug for the audience here because when we look at how those laws are being defined and how they differ per country, uh, oh my gosh, yeah, who can argue that uh, an individual with a ton of libelous slander out there directed against them personally shouldn't have some ability to fade back into the background without this horrible stuff appearing on every search engine. You gotta sympathize with that, recognizing that there can be abuses on the other side of it, and hey, I'm just a little entrepreneur in my travel space. I don't have a good answer <laughs> to most of that, but perhaps some folks in the room can move in that direction, because those are really interesting questions. Yeah, Steve talked about uh, this regime in the United States that has been a sort of a first amendment for the internet here, which uh, protects from liability any online platform that doesn't itself author the content. And that's given rise to enormous proliferation of new businesses and investment because it's a, it's a certainty for those companies. They know that they're not gonna be liable. 
more of a risk now in Europe, and frankly, uh, more of a risk for their indigenous businesses that now have to worry about hiring lots of people to remove content. So it's a trade-off, and we're again, I, I do believe, we're at a very primitive time in our relationship to the internet, and the bureaucrats are gonna have to figure out just how difficult it is when you're not being a good steward for speech. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to figure it out. It's, a, it's an interesting question, and I, I recommend uh, my friend, our Victor Meyer Schoenberger's book, Delete, that is about how we've lost the ability to forget things because of the internet. And so he, there's a part of his book where I have no idea where these, these studies, what, you know, uh, how many there are, but there's these studies of people who actually don't have the uh, capacity to forget. Most of us remember good social interactions and forget negative ones, and that's actually what makes human interaction possible. But some people don't have that capability of forgetting the bad interactions. And those people have a very difficult time carrying on human relationships. And if one of the consequences of this early internet is we cannot forget socially the, per the, the person who's been libeled or uh, had a bad spell and all of this stuff has come out about them, that may create some significant problems that we want to deal with. Hi, my name is Jacob. I'm a sophomore here at the college, and I'll be asking a question on behalf of our Twitter audience here tonight. The question is, if a worst nightmare is 500 governments with 500 different internet regulations, where should we centrally regulate the internet from? Excellent. We need only those global rules that are necessary for the free flow of information. Everything else should be left to local control. So we need functioning IP addresses that we can address. We need an interoperable internet. We need to have high, high connectivity across the world. Sovereigns, though, retain their power over speech within their borders, and there's not much we can do about that. And all we can do is encourage the idea that more speech is better. It's actually a democratic movement around the, country, around the world and something that's been a big part of the U.S. foreign policy. Mm -hmm. I, would, uh, I would certainly agree. I think there is a role in this country for our government, though, to help maybe lead by example, not by law in all cases, but by setting a best practice or the, the U.S. government, after carefully considering a particular issue, recommends to the local city, state governments to adopt the following perspective on a particular topic. So what I, what I concern about is, is you know, that classic Uber example where you have a really strong, very local lobby standing in the way of a reasonable innovation at a very local level, in one city, in Cambridge, in some other place that's preventing, and it's just politics, and it's local politics, and it's noisy politics, and it's really unfortunate for all the rest of us, and providing those politicians that need to be independent, the air cover of the federal government saying, hey, this is something that we think is good to help give them a little bit of uh, a backstop to help the individual politician make the right decision. Hi, my name is Brian Renault, and I'm just starting a master's in public policy here at the Kennedy School. Um, so I apologize if this causes you to repeat yourself a little bit, because I think you've answered it in part. But I can think of at least three different areas uh, where the U.S. has been criticized for falling behind um, in the internet space, and that's infrastructure, kind of bandwidth things, um, equality of access, and digital governments, uh, governance, rather. Should be able to spell that, given where I'm going to school. Um, and so I know there's other countries doing, doing more on any of those fronts. Uh, how complicit or responsible has the government been in letting us slide behind, if indeed that's an accurate um, um, depiction, and what can we do? Well, um, <laughs> on the infrastructure point, I've, I've spent a lot of my life on this, and what we did 10 years ago was just to remove all regulations from internet access infrastructure in the United States, and that's led us to a position where we pay far too much if we're rich people for second class internet access and we leave behind a lot of Americans. There's good news just today. The FCC chairman, Tom Wheeler, said that uh, at the, in the marketplace for 25 megabit per second speed and above, we don't have competition. At least we're now acknowledging that. And that's a step, right? This is where the role of government is central, to ensure that just as we have a national highway system, we need to have world-class infrastructure in this country that is cheap, ubiquitous, and available like clean water. 
will get there. We're not moving fast enough from my perspective. On the digital governance side, I am seeing leadership in cities across the country. Chicago is really tremendous on this front. They're trying. It's all still pretty primitive, but they're doing their best. And um, they're great people in there, and wonderful leadership and terrific technical people inside. And the digital divide remains one of our most severe problems as a society. How can it be that we're leaving so many Americans behind? Inequality is our greatest threat as a country. It leads to a lack of social cohesion, real distrust in the entities that are policing us, and actually makes life a lot more difficult for entrepreneurs because they can't predict a, a large market that they can sell to because people are just too busy trying to scramble through the day. They're not going to be looking at, at luxuries. So addressing inequality through communications technology and governance is, is uh, our foremost challenge right now, I think. Hi, my name is Neil Cohen. I'm a privacy lawyer at Perkins Coie and an incoming research fellow at the Berkman Center. Mm -hmm. Stephen, earlier you talked about aggregate data and how it's used by businesses in the U.S. And I'm curious to know your thoughts about, uh, in Europe, data protection law is currently going through a reform process. Uh, they're seeking to expand the definition of personal data, introduce direct prohibitions to profiling activities, to essentially ban the, what funds the current online economy, advertising uh, and the like. I was curious to know what you think about that, as both from a cross-board perspective and how you think business might adapt. Well, I'm probably not up on the issue as much as maybe I should be. <laughs> I, I, but I do see all of the messages anytime I go to an international site or a TripAdvisor site internationally that asks me to accept whatever the terms and conditions, a new privacy, a new cookie, a new this and that. And like every other citizen in the world, I say, yeah, whatever, click. And <laughs> life goes on just as it did before. So I'm just not sure that uh, you know, I mean, yes, putting that, uh, that, that, that banner up there changes things, but I'm not sure how much more behavior or how much of the internet economy is going to change because of that interruption. I don't know if you know more than I. Yeah. Could I clarify one point? Sure. Yeah. Um, so that's in relation to the e-privacy directive, which regulates the placement of cookies, has no connection to personal data. The current data protection directive in Europe is being replaced, hopefully or potentially within the next few years, what's known as the general data protection regulation. Under that law, they're expanding the definition of personal data to include aggregate data, and then as personal data or personal information, there will be a direct ban on profiling activities. So beyond the cookie um, banners, the ones you have explicit consent from individuals, tick a box to do these activities. So a bit of a change in the landscape. So my misunderstanding of the question then. So it, in in so much as there's talk or direction that actually requires folks to uh, get new permissions to do more things with new data that actually changes how every internet company can operate, those are just not going to make it through. Because every citizen in those countries, when faced with, oh, I can't use any shopping service online anymore because they don't conform, you know, I, I'm not sure it'll be a French Revolution all over again, but, you know, it's, uh, it, it's not likely to fly, and those laws would likely be, I would hope, amended quite quickly to become reasonable. Most folks like us, uh, uh, you know, companies that are offering you know, goods or services, kind of just want the, the roadmap and the roadmap to be applied equally so that no one's at a particular disadvantage, and then we argue about the extra restrictions or not, because it makes it more difficult to sell, internet taxation, whatever. But those are kind of the standard country by country disagreements. Those, those are less major policy issues, I'd say. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Hugo. I'm a freshman at the college. And I wanted the panel's opinion on how China's internet regulations has limited its socioeconomic development and what opportunities may be available if such regulations could be loosened. Uh, so uh, we, you know, TripAdvisor does play in the content category in China. Content is regulated carefully, uh, and we've had no problems whatsoever for the most part. Huh. So when you look at content being regulated, there are rules in place, certainly, uh, but uh, the government truly seems to be most interested in preventing, uh, my take, preventing a social gathering that is anti-government in nature, whether the social gathering be online or offline. So 
the rest of the content when it's one of criticisms, in our case of hotels or restaurants, absolutely no interest whatsoever. When you look at the China internet economy, the big players, how incredibly successful they are, how everyone's online, how it's so significantly mobile, you, know, you kind of have to wonder what's wrong with that picture. It's going pretty well. And while there's a tremendous amount of free speech regulation in place, I, I'm not sure it's damaged the, uh, the e-commerce economy there much at all. And the other side of that is that the thing that the government fears most is the power of the internet to allow people to sure. gather together and, and to be disruptive. So, and that, that, I think, demonstrates the brittleness of that system, that there's so much fear and so much examination of speech, not hurting commerce necessarily, but interfering with autonomy and agency. Very good. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Um, thank you, my name is Fernando. Um, I'm a fellow here at the Carr Center at the Kennedy School. No. Um, and hopefully this will touch on a couple of things you guys have mentioned. Um, when we talk about the internet and internet as a force for democracy and policy, we have to talk about it as a very global and cosmopolitan force in the world, yet a lot of the internet companies, uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter, a lot of the main ones are American. Um, so when we're talking about internet policy in particular, is, is that a problem? And are there any practical steps that we can do to have our policy conversation be a bit more global? Well, which, which, can I ask which policies do you have in mind? Because there is quite a bit of global, in fact, sure, right now there's an endless meeting going on. In sure. Uh, for example, we're talking about possible defamation claims uh, where uh, Latin America might have, even Latin American countries right. might have very particular laws about defamation, which might be different than American, which might be yeah. different than EU. So um, I guess it was sort of a leading question, uh, yeah. but I'm just curious whether, whether we need more sort of international coordination when we're talking about um, internet policy? Well, so I've been very active in this area as a member of the ICANN board in the past, and um, here's my view, that the, the America's, American policy has been a good steward for speech around the world, and actually has not interfered with what other countries want to do uh, when it comes to certainly domain names and IP addresses. And so the, the plumbing is working pretty well, and it's to a country's advantage to stay connected to that plumbing. I also, though, feel that it is within a sovereign's ambit to make decisions about speech within their territory. So I'm not troubled by the current balance, which allows for a lot of flow of information around the world, and yet local control of speech where appropriate. I do think that inevitably, more speech will turn out to be attractive to uh, countries, but that's because I can't help it. I'm an American. <laughs> Well, I'd like everybody to join me in giving a big hand to a five-star <laughs> panel presentation on every dimension. And you can ask uh, Stephen all your travel questions. Um, informally, I'm going to ask him where the best place for a faculty member to take a vacation is. And um, don't forget to buy Susan's book, The Responsive City. Thank you. Guys. Thank you.